You are listening to The Dish on Health IT, brought to you by Point of Care Partners, a leading health IT consultancy. Each episode will feature a rotating panel of senior consultants and guests who will talk about trends and innovations in health IT, while also highlighting how organizations can leverage these advances to solve their business problems. This episode features the co-chairs of the HL7 Fire at Scale Task Force Accelerator, better known as FAST. Our guest, Deepak Sadagapan, Chief Operating Officer of Population Health with Providence Health System, and Duncan Weatherston, CEO of Smile Digital Health, will discuss fast transition from an ONC initiative into an HL7 fire accelerator, the importance of building a strong framework for a national fire infrastructure, why fire scalability is critical, and how coordination and collaboration across the fire community is fundamental. We hope you find today's episode informative and helpful. If you have topic ideas you'd like us to cover in future episodes, be sure to share them with us by emailing us at podcast at POCP.com or tweeting us at POCPHIT. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dish on Health IT, where we invite health IT innovators and catalysts to break down and discuss some of health IT's biggest news and most exciting milestones. We at Point of Care Partners are health IT consultants. We work with stakeholders across the healthcare ecosystem, and we're viewed as an independent, trusted party, Switzerland. I'm Ken Kleinberg, Senior Consultant and Innovation Lead here at Point of Care Partners, and I'm pleased to be back as your host for this episode. My colleague and co-host, the wonderful Jocelyn Keegan and I, are excited to welcome our special guests who are co-chairs of the Fire at Scale Task Force, or FAST. Welcome Deepak Setagopan, Chief Operating Officer, Population Health with Providence, and Duncan Weatherston, CEO of Smile Digital Health. Today's episode, we'll dig into what FAST is up to now that it's transitioned from an ONC initiative into an HL7 fire accelerator, the importance of building a strong framework for a fire infrastructure, why fire scalability is crucial, and how coordination and collaboration across the fire community is integral. But before we jump into our discussion, I'd like to have Jocelyn briefly introduce herself, tell us what she's looking forward to learning from today's discussion. Joss. Thanks a lot, Ken. Super excited to be here today. I'm I'm Point of Care Partners Payer Practice Lead, and uh, I would say in general, I'm devoted to positive change, building and getting stuff done. My focus at Point of Care Partners is on interoperability, prior authorizations, really where the convergence of tech standards and uh, prior authorizations and product strategy sort of fit in. I also happen to be the um, program manager for what started as this conceptual idea of building on the backs of Argonaut um, to bring payers and providers together uh, to work on value-based care and clinical interoperability that's become DaVinci and, and likely probably the biggest of the accelerators to date. But I'm super excited to have both Duncan and Zipak here with us today. Because in a large part, um, much of what is the foundational work that's happening fast actually came out of early discussions with the DaVinci founding members and ONC as we were really starting to ramp up how we were going to bring these transaction sets live and these APIs live in production. um, And how could we learn from previous mistakes in the industry uh, to make sure that we've got the right building blocks and foundations in place as we start to scale beyond point-to-point close trading partners. And, and, and it's been exciting to see the progress as the project itself has moved forward. And we are moving forward implementation-wise at a large scale with fire uh, deployment in the market today. Thanks, Jocelyn. Now, let's meet our guests, Deepak and Duncan. Will each of you please introduce yourselves and include a little bit about how you came to become co-chairs of FAST. Deepak, let's start with you. Yeah, well, Jocelyn and Ken, thank you for the opportunity. Duncan, it's been a pleasure to serve with you. Look forward to more of the more of what we've been doing together. My name is Deepak Sadagopan. Hello, everybody. I serve as Chief Operating Officer for Population Health with Providence Health System. I've been actively engaged in the standard space and particularly as it relates to the adoption of FIRE for the past few years and been actively working with Jocelyn and, and our and our close friends at Da Vinci for the past few years and, and actively leading uh, the uh, adoption of standards and and the and the value of uh, uh, propagating the value of standards, advocating for the value of standards in the value-based care space. Um, to me, the north star is really what CMS has set for us as across all the industry. Then by 2030, uh, CMS is projecting that 100% of all Medicare payments will be through a value-based care initiative, and what and that for all of us 
no matter what you are and uh, what your role is and which part of the industry you are in is incredibly important because it cuts to the core of sustainability of Medicare for all of us, for, our, for the entire population. And in order to make that happen, the foundational infrastructure that supports that has to be scalable, has to be, has to include a wide variety, it has to be consistent, it has to reduce ad administrative cost. And for that, the traditional ways of doing connections between one point to another that are fairly inconsistent across all these different health information exchanges and different approaches that we've tried in the past impose a fair amount of administrative cost and push us in the opposite direction. And so when ONC reached out uh, to me almost like a few years back, a couple of years back actually, to, to talk about this FAST initiative and really to make it scalable, it resonated with me and to actually create a point of scalability. Because as I will share at some point during this conversation today, we face realistic the scalability issues in when we are implementing these initiatives in the field. And I see ONC's, uh, ONC's FAST initiative and now an HL7 accelerator to be a point of resolution in our journey towards achieving more scalability and reduced administrative cost. And that's why I'm excited to be part of FAST, excited to be uh, learning from Duncan as well as serving with him as, 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 as we go through all of this whole process together and excited to be serving with a whole bunch of incredibly talented people at the table with FAST that I continue to learn from every day, but is incredibly delighted to share and our opportunities and, and experiences as well as the healthcare delivery system in the space. Probably more than what you asked of what you asked for, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Deepak. I love that enthusiasm. Duncan, how about you? Yeah. Um, I want to first of all say I, I share Deepak's enthusiasm for the team that has been put together to support the Fire Scale Task Force. All of the members that I've had the privilege to work with are well-informed, engaged, have a deep belief in the value of the FIRE proposition, and are really interested in ensuring that all of the community have the tools they need to be able to participate effectively, which is essentially the heart of what we're trying to do at FAST. My background, I've been an architect in healthcare since the late 90s. And I've played roles in pretty much every aspect of the delivery of population health, hospital, and primary care systems, both in terms of the clinical value and the, the implementation value that it provides for the systems in behind it. I was really interested in the Fire at Scale Task Force because as a consequence of founding Smile Digital Health, we have a big focus on the importance of transformation in healthcare that can be delivered by the FIRE standard. It is critical that we build tooling and capabilities that are easily adoptable by a broad community that can drive the connectivity, that can drive the identity, that can drive the scalability, security, and, and all those other features which enable us to participate using this standard. And, and the reason for the importance is that we believe that an API-driven approach to healthcare is the necessary bedrock for the real transformation in the delivery of care that's to come. If you think about the transformations that have happened in every other industry, when they've gone from a pre-internet to a post-internet model, healthcare is ready for that type of change. And once we get to that type of change, you can imagine the transformations of all you think about is how much banking changed or how much music changed or how much every other aspect was transformed by it. That gives you a hint as to where we're going in healthcare. But healthcare is so much more complicated or complex than those other industries that it's really going to get additional benefit from the immediacy of that type of interaction from the direct personal relationships, from the direct engagement between clinician, patient, payer, and the research community. I think the whole effect of what we're trying to accomplish is going to be transformational in terms of longevity, well-being, and all those things that we as patients need. So with such an obvious pathway to value, I was immediately interested when people told me about the opportunity to join FAST as a member, and I was fortunate enough to be um, able to participate at a more involved level. And I've learned a tremendous amount from my colleagues, and there's a long pathway for us to go to get to where we want to get to the complete level of engagement that's necessary for the success we hope to have with FAR. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, and uh, glad that your paths brought us to us today. So as we get into our discussion about FAST, perhaps you could say a little bit more about its history and uh, where we are today. Duncan, perhaps you could just keep going. I'll throw that first question uh, at you. For sure. So the Fire at Scale Task Force actually started as an ONC project, um, and its goal was 
to build on the work being done by other communities like Da Vinci and the base fire standard space to determine how we might properly expand and adopt the, the solutions that they're proposing. It has since transformed uh, into what we call an accelerator, which is an independent body as far as the HL7 space as a task force providing advice to the community. Where we're going, of course, has been defined historically by the originating group. We're adding to it today. Some of the founding members were broadly distributed across the community. We have companies like Epic and Integrators, and we have organizations like Deepax. We have the whole gamut of the implementation and the thought leadership community out there, Humana. It doesn't matter where you look in the industry, there's been some engagement with anybody who's got a large stake and who are interested in seeing this roll forward. I think one of the things that's really important for us as we go forward on this is the consistency of the model that we bring to the community. And we're going to talk about that a bit as we go through this conversation conversation. But but ideally, all of us should be singing from the same songbook when it comes to how we interoperate in this sort of burgeoning API landscape. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, I like how you describe fast work as uh, solving common challenges, creating a common adoption model for the fire community. I think hearing real world examples of some of the challenges faced out there is helpful to crystallize uh, the problem that you're trying to solve. So I ask this next question to Deepak, with the perspective of a provider organization, and I've always thought that Providence was one of the most incredible out there. So Deepak, can you share some examples of the challenges uh, providers faced where fast work could be applied? Yeah, happy to. You know, I, I like to keep things simple, so I'll, I'll just narrate like one situation that we're in. Like, uh, And for those of you who are not familiar with Providence, Providence is a, a pretty big, health, uh, widely spread geographically health system across the West Coast, um, all the way from you know rural parts of Alaska to rural parts of Texas on the West Coast. So we have concentrated urban areas of population like Seattle and LA, and then we have like widely dispersed rural areas of population that we serve as well. So we have some incredible challenges in actually measuring how we care for our population in terms of quality of care. It's one of the key things we, we have to do is to, unless you measure it, you can't, you can't address it. So measurement of how we actually deliver care is super important to us. The second thing I would say in a, in a couple of our regions, specifically in regions like in, uh, in across all of our regions, there is this development of provider networks. So we actually have a whole bunch of affiliates that we have to work with to coordinate care. And we work with those affiliates, not only from a care coordination from a patient to patient perspective, but we also partner with those affiliates to uh, share in, you know, as part of ACO arrangements or other types of arrangements where we are collectively Providence and our affiliates and partners are held accountable to quality and total cost of care for a defined set of uh, populations. In those situations that have become, that's becoming increasingly common, going back to my earlier comment about 100% of everything in Medicare is value-based going in, in a few years, and we are already seeing movement towards that, almost half of it already is. We find ourselves in a situation where we, uh, like, for example, for one region, we have 45 different affiliates and we have about 23 different electronic health records dispersed across that system and about 10 different payers from which we have to receive claims data. That's kind of the complexity in one region where we have to measure quality of care for about 300,000 beneficiaries covered under different ACO arrangements. When you take that problem space and really look at it, for us to be able to create one platform, healthcare is incredibly siloed despite all the progress we've made. I can me measure all the quality within Epic for the populations we serve within Providence. And, and our partner can measure all the quality measures that they have to do with an Intergy or like Greenway or some whatever system they use at their end. But it doesn't tell us we have uh, we have not been able to successfully get a scalable initiative together where we can actually create a common platform for measurement, no matter what system we are all in, to measure a common set of quality measures. Now, that requires receiving claims data from 10 different payers for all these different arrangements, marrying that with clinical data that we actually generate in each of these electronic health records and com computing numerators and denominators for each of these initiatives, right? It starts with how scalable is this? If, if uh, we, and when we are starting this process, we are going to have to go to every single payer to kind of get their the type of claims data from them, be able to share clinical data back with those payers. And similarly, with each of our uh, affiliates, be able to ingest clinical data from them on a point-to-point -point basis. Now, that's our current state. 
Now imagine a state where you can be, uh, you can, you'll have a more one central directory where you know that each of these payers are ready to publish clinical data and you're able to literally query which patient has data under which payer organization, which provider organization are, are able to uh, use APIs to then say, give me all the data related to this patient or the set of patients, uh, both in terms of claims and clinical data associated with all the organizations that know about that patient and have dealt with that patient before. It dramatically simplifies how much effort is required to, to undertake uh, even a quality measurement like that. So in a very real and practical way, the, our ability to scale across multiple endpoints to, to evolve to where healthcare delivery is right now. In some ways, the business of healthcare has far marched ahead of where our infrastructure is. So we live in a cross-enterprise type environment where 40% of care delivery occurs outside the walls of our health system. For us to be able to measure quality effectively and outcomes effectively, creating a scalable way and a platform to ingest information and identify where information sits for the populations we serve is, I cannot even underline how important that is. And to me, FAST is, sits at the core of solving that problem in terms of identifying to taking that last mile and really creating a scalable pathway to uh, consistently connect to each of those endpoints and create that measurement framework. So, yeah, that certainly resonates. Uh, and you're giving us some sense of the challenges of identifying so many organizations dealing with so many uh, quality issues and so forth. So it's clear that FAST is focused on infrastructure and scalability. Uh, would either of you want to expound on how FAST fits in with the other fire accelerators? Duncan? Yeah. So, um, the way to think about FAST is as an accelerator for accelerators. The goal here is that you know we're trying to find a way to fill the, the gaps and overcome barriers to scalable fire solutions. We're trying to coordinate and collaborate and align the fire community on policy and approaches to issues and harmonize existing efforts. And the way we do that is through broad engagement in response to requests for the larger policy issues around how you deploy fire solutions in terms of how you engage with the various requests for comments that come out and largely how we collaborate amongst very broad community of people who are implementing and developing models and, and, and approaches to the fire standard. We have a set of specific implementation guides that we're working on around things like identity, um, security, uh, intermediary access, so how you how you proxy content backwards and forwards, and and provider directory. So we have we have a set of IGs that are pretty pretty fundamental to the infrastructure deployment we have. But more than that, we're looking at opportunities where we think similarly collaborative strategies to the creation of capability to be able to to interact with across across organizations that have the need for information in common, but perhaps different governance frameworks and different accountabilities. The approach we're taking is trying to find ways to sort of fit into that model and where we can drive that kind of interoperability and, and participate in those communities. There's a huge benefit that arises from this, which is we're not trying to dictate to anybody how they should solve the problems, but we're just trying to encourage that we should collaboratively solve problems together. And where we see the opportunities to drive that alignment, we're weighing in and participating. All right, well, we're going to bring Jocelyn into the conversation now. Joss, with these fire accelerators and the work you're doing with DaVinci, this payer provider fire accelerator, how has FAST helped you out? How are you working with that? Yeah, so I think it's really important to think about sort of everything that I think Deepak sort of laid out, but think about it compounded, right, across thousands of provider organizations and hundreds of payer organizations in the industry, right? And that's just that ecosystem. Um, and why it's important that we have somebody looking at the macro picture and really figuring out what those foundational guides are. Providence is a, is a really mature, large, complex organization, you know, which is ahead of the market in so many ways. So I, I almost feel like and Deepak is sort of like the advanced team coming back to say, hey, we need some of this, right? These core capabilities are missing. And it's been really important to have, I think, strong voices to talk about that practical day-to-day -day reality of what's happening for the people that are deploying. You know, we are seeing challenges today in the rollout of DaVinci and people looking to implement where so much of the fact-finding of who's got a server live, who's in production is a very manual human process today, right? 
versus people being able to publish to an endpoint directory and say, hello, I'm on, right? So we know the footprint of Fire is much higher than what you're sort of seeing publicly reporting, you know, what people are press releasing about or talking in their product strategies about or owning up to sort of who's live or who's not live, who's got active usage. You know, the footprint is much larger, but it's not, it literally, literally, you need a human being to go and make a connection with another human being. So if, if we think about sort of this shift out of sort of the ONC world in the industry, I'd say taking back sort of the artifacts and, and driving, now, getting into the driver's seat, with fast, I think that it's, you know, it's the first step of saying, you know, everybody agrees using these modern standards is important. But if we don't get these foundational pieces out, it's like a rate limiting factor to have fast, everybody can get the benefit of their existing investments that they're making in fire today. Uh, and and I, I think that to me, the existing guides, you know, endpoint discovery and, and security and the other ones that Duncan mentioned are, are really critically important um, if we're going to be able to get to that promise of, you know, really self-discovery, real automation um, in a way that we just can't be today. Uh, you know, we make endpoint connections today on a day-to-day -day basis. Anybody that's ever had to get a secure connection with their partner for the first time understands what a painful process that is, no matter how routine it should be. And I think that us being able to operate sort of at the speed of the internet um, is going to be important and proving out and getting these guides available and getting people to these early adopters and sort of people that are already active fire users, exercising them and maturing them, I think is critically important to really all of us to get the ROI benefit out of the investment that's being made in the system here. All right. So thanks, uh, Jocelyn. Uh, as we're diving into this concept of scalability and we've talked about the large number of endpoints that we need to deal with. Uh, what other aspects of scalability are of concern here or focus? Uh, data volume, uh, number of transactions, uh, DPAC, uh, do you have uh, a comment on that? Yeah, I do actually want to surprise Jocelyn. You know, going back to that example that I shared earlier, right? You know, you, you take that uh, you take that example of like we have to interact with as, a, as one organization with about like 12 different payers, right? The way we receive who, uh, who, which patients are covered under an ACO arrangement from payer A is different from how we receive that same information from payer B. In some cases, it's an Excel spreadsheet today. Some, some cases, it's a standard transaction. We've implemented FIRE with actually a couple of our partners today. And so it's actually a mixed bag right now. So problem number one is consistency in adoption of standard. We want every endpoint to use the same way to tell us which patients are covered under their particular ACO arrangement. That's that's number one. So that's a standards issue. The second is even if the standard is defined, we don't want to be able to develop 10 different connections and have 10 different ways to say, you know, is pay, do you have paid data for patient A under your organization and then have to check, pull 10 different organizations at the same time. It would be great to have a directory type structure where we're able to identify that collectively across all of these different endpoints in one point and then use the efficiency of standards to, uh, to interact the same way. And so problem number two is consistency, right? The nature of the consistency and a consistency in adoption of the standards and the scalability across these different endpoints, like what we do with one endpoint should be applicable to another endpoint as well. And I think those are the two problems that we are looking to solve. And we've been successful in solving it in small microcosms, but it's now nowhere near the type of scalability that uh, broad adoption that, that is needed to create, make a dent in the spaces that we operate. And again, to me, all of these issues that we talk about from a technical standpoint have a real, very real operational consequence for people that work in the field, in the trenches, actually managing care. And that's what I go to is if what we're doing doesn't uh, contribute to that. And if you're just redoing an existing uh, interoperability exchange, Jocelyn knows very well that I don't shy about talking about it. And that's kind of what we've been trying to do is to be that flag bearer and say, hey, you guys, look at this problem. We, we're not able to solve this. We need your help, whether you're in DaVinci or HL7 or FAST. We'll need to find a way to work through it because sooner or later, everybody's going to run into this. Yeah. Duncan, Jocelyn, what do you want to add more? Sure. When I think about scalability, the core element for me is consistency across many, many adopters. 
Oftentimes when we think about scalability, we think about hard, high volume transactions or lots of data flowing backwards and forwards. And of course, once we're at scale, we have to support that. But as Deepak was pointing out, and it goes in both directions, it's really important that when you as an organization reach out to the hundreds or thousands of others that you have to deal with, that you're doing it the same way. And each of those endpoints needs to be facing the same problem you are, that when they reach out to the hundreds and thousands of partners that they deal with, they're interacting the same way. So the whole goal of scalability, as we see it at FAST, is creating a consistent fashion in which every endpoint can have a reliable and predictable mechanism by which they can discover, relate, log in, transact, and then retrieve information the same way every time. And the problem we're facing today is that we live in this heterogeneous environment where that's just not true. If you're a payer, as Deepak was pointing out, and you want to work with providers, you have to coordinate with each provider discreetly. And then if you're a provider and you're working with payers, you have to coordinate with each payer discreetly. And then if you're a researcher trying to gather information, you're hoping that there's some aggregator out there who's done the job for you, finding information, putting it into a particular location. And we have a number of companies whose whole job is to find information and then find a way to transform it into a format that fits into some other destination. This just does not deliver the ability for us to deploy a scalable methodology for information. And the reason it's so important for us to deploy that scalable methodology for information is that we can't make the changes to healthcare while we're still stuck struggling to get one data feed from one location to match to the needs of information that we have for a second data feed and a third feed. We have to get past this tower of Babel that exists in our community. And so to me, the scalability issue we're addressing first and foremost is the consistency of communication and the repeatability of that process amongst all of the interested parties. From there, of course, we think there's a lot of expansion value we're going to go after. And so we think that the Fire at Scale Task Force will continue to play a role after we get through these first four implementation guides. But really the starting point is, is this ability for us all to interoperate together consistently. And I would just chime in with one point to sort of tie together, I think, what the two guys were saying. I think the leveling aspect of being able to get everybody in a consistent methodology at scale is incredibly important here. And I think it goes two ways. I think it's about letting the really small provider or community member or care out in the community um, participant or the member or the payer play like they're a big guy. And I think it also is that ability of letting that big guy, you know, get people out of portals, getting the information to where it needs to be to that really long tail in healthcare, right? So that you can get the data in real time where it's needed and just the right amount of data. And I know we'll talk about this a little bit more, but, you know, to this idea of like the right information at the right time, because it's easy to do and it's easily discoverable. So when I think about scale, I think it's about broadening the number of participants being able to leverage information at the right time. So this challenge of uh, being consistent, it's just caused so many headaches. And uh, you think about railroad tracks in different parts of the world, about mobile phone networks, ATM networks, electrical standards. My daughter's traveling through Europe now. Very fortunate uh, that she's had that opportunity. And I gave her a whole bag full of different plugs for the different electrical grids that she's going to face. Is that an apt analogy to what we're facing here in U.S. healthcare, or what's your favorite analogy, Duncan? Yeah, so I think it's I, so I think it's a good analogy. Um, I'd like to call attention to what Jocelyn just said because I think it's a really critical point, which is that those power plugs work regardless of whether you're plugging your laptop in, or whether you're plugging a stove in, or whether you're plugging uh, you know your car in for recharging. They may have different connectors, but the fundamental connectivity, the grid that supplies that power remains consistent. Uh, and I think it, the, the the idea that we all have the same experience is, is very important. I think one of the advantages that we see with the plug system is at least within broad regions, the plugs remain the same. If I'm in Seattle or if I'm in Miami, I'm plugging using the same technology. Perhaps if I, if I travel to London, I have to change. But at least within North America, I mean, if I'm in Toronto or if I'm in, I'm in Panama now, I'm using the same plug here. Th- that consistency is enabling us to have common technologies. And where those plugs exist in various formats, I'm going to drive this analogy into the ground. You know, what we see is that I can plug my laptop in in Europe and we've 
managed to figure out how do we deal with some of the other aspects of the grid that are important. You know, my, 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 my laptop is able to adjust to a 220 volt environment and accommodate some of the, the other characteristics of, of the power grid. So when we look at healthcare, we have nothing like that. It, it would be more as if every time you get to a new location, you have to break out your toolkit and rewire your device into the wall and hope for the best. And through trial and error and a little bit of smoke, get your, your solution working. And as we said before, that's clearly not a scalable approach. If you imagine that everywhere you went, you had to bring your personal electrician with you, you'd find that electricians were in way more demand than we could ever supply. And, and that's where we find ourselves today. So I think the analogy is really apt. And I think the consequences of the lack of plugs that we have today is exactly what we're seeing. Okay, great. I, I can tell a story about an electric blanket, but we'll save that for another day. How about we turn to uh, how, uh, as some people would say, the sausage is made. Uh, how do you guys create these uh, common solutions and common common implementation models and then pull that through to adoption? Uh, how does FAST do this? Uh, Duncan? So we have a few ways that we tackle this. I mean, the first one is... You know, the I'll call it the brute force method. We have four implementation guides that we're working on, and we've been through the through the grind to make sure that they pass through the appropriate standards processes. And so we're we're really supporting the elements that we've talked about directly, um, and and through you know the efforts of a, a very skilled team of experts who are attuned to the challenges that we're discussing. But I think it extends beyond that as well. I think. One of the key aspects we have to be able to do beyond just the specific implementation guys that we're working on is find the way to bring the community to the table to talk about the problems that they're discovering with scalability and then expose those as potential collaborative pathways going forward. And I think we do that through communication. We reach out to the other accelerators. We reach out to the other people implementing uh, their own implementation guides, and we try to have a broad conversation we try very hard to keep our ear to the ground and listen for opportunities to comment on things that we think are relevant to scalability. And oftentimes, they're conversations which more properly belong in other accelerators. So, for example, Da Vinci is always at the forefront of our thoughts when it comes to the payer community and, and that type of integration with providers as well. And so we try to tag on where we think that the scalability and the adoptability components reflected in ideas that we have and, and where we try to provide advice when we can as well. And I think that collaboration and that approach, which says, you know, our doors are always open and where we see our walls is pretty translucent and ambiguous. We manage to maintain relationships and, and provide opinion only hopefully within the scope of our own mandate, but to everybody that we can. Deepak, anything to add? Yeah, I would say the way I look at FAST is, you know, like use, using an analogy of an organizational structure that we're all familiar with. I look at FAST as essentially a shared service for all the other accelerators. Like if you think of all the other accelerators are in, as individual business units, I mean, FAST is a common service that supports each of these other accelerators in enablement of the, and, ex, and really scaling the standards that they are developing through the last mile. And the last mile is really what FAST is focused on, is uh, which is how do you take a standard that has been developed, finalized, voted on, a broad set of industry stakeholders are actually saying that this is the way we want to exchange data and this content is accurate. How do you take that and really apply it consistently across a large number of endpoints? I mean, that's the problem FAST is here to solve. And we think that is a, there's a natural transition and a complementary um, service that will benefit every one of these accelerators. Yeah, thanks, Jocelyn with DaVinci. How are you getting everybody to row uh, in the same direction, if you will? Yeah, and I I would say just to maybe branch off a little bit than just from a DaVinci perspective, because I think Duncan's point is really, um, and, and Deepak's points are really point on, right? We're really looking at sort of how can we commonly be solving these challenges? And I think one of the things I've gotten to see in my seat, um, both from DaVinci and from a point of care partner's perspective, because our team also helps support the FAST initiative, is that idea of this sense of community and the convening power of FAST, I think, has been really powerful to be able to bring to a head topics that were, because they didn't have any clear ownership, could languish within the community of sort of like somebody else is going to figure that out. And really, if you look at that core set of guides that are that are sort of being tossed around today and sort of the stuff that's getting queued up, it really is that stuff that cuts across everyone. And in addition to the accelerators, also gets the, the core fire team 
and the and and the and the aspects of the how is fire evolving um, as a as a standard community from HL seven really engaged, and I think the cross pollination of, of fast coming into formally coming into um, HL seven has been really powerful. To, I think tighten those connections. And, and it's funny, having now worked on a number of the accelerators over the last few years, I think that you can't discount just the convening conversation, discussing and brainstorming with your peers, how are we really going to solve this problem aspect of the work that's happening under the umbrella of the accelerators, whether it's Argonaut or the new public health group, Helios, or the work that we've been doing on Da Vinci. So, so I think people are looking for FAST and where FAST is headed pulling that into their day-to-day existence in a really powerful way. Because in order to get beyond sort of these initial sites or blanket mandates, right? Like we had with patient access API, everyone has to stand up directory. Everyone has to stand up formulary. Everybody has to stand up PDEX. For patient apps, what do we do to actually start to take advantage of all those endpoints that are on now, right? How do we actually start to let people self-discover? Um, and I think that that'll be an incredibly important evolution but you know, to date, we've really been relying on reporting coming out of the ONC team about who has fire servers on and who has fire servers off, right? Wouldn't it be great if we could if we could figure out how to find each other independently um, without relying on sort of manual reporting of progress of uh, of actual live APIs? So, all right, thanks. Uh, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes and talk about uh, national exchange and interoperability. I'm talking about TEFCA, the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. Uh, Health and Human Services recently announced their first wave of uh, half a dozen organizations. They're approved as the so-called Qualified Health Information Networks, or QNs, basically super nodes, and some might go live uh, by the end of this year. So TEFCA isn't a fire-specific framework, although there is a recently introduced fire roadmap payload support, as well as facilitated and brokered fire exchange in the future. So the question is, is TEFCA on the right track? Duncan, do you want to take that one on first? Sure. So I think the intent of TEFCA is admirable, and I believe that their goals are very well aligned with what we're trying to accomplish in the fire community and in fast and specific. I think the really critical piece is that we need to have a consistent strategy and a consistent set of standards for all of the members and participants in the community to be able to share information. This would imply, I think, or one could infer, that TEFCA needs to participate in the standards community very broadly, ensuring that what they publish and what they believe is the right way to go is reflective and integrated with what the community is putting out in terms of design and implementation. And to date, TEFCA is clearly identified their alignment with FIRE, there is potentially additional alignment that we can all engage in, in Da Vinci, in FAST, in Gravity, and and the number of other accelerators out there which are delivering value. And I think it's really important if we're going to move forward that we don't have divergent standards. And and I think this this is the most important point I have in my head around TEFCA, is that the character of the implementation of TEFCA must align with the character of the implementation in the community, or else we'll be forcing everybody to build again to a heterogeneous environment and try to figure out how they decide which standard is appropriate for which activity. Deepak, what about you? I'll take it back to that example I've been talking about. Like if I, in that situation, if I'm exchanging clinical data with like X number of payers and X number of providers, if like 50% of those providers are on document-based exchange, which is like, you know, traditional standards of exchanging CCDA and things like that. And about 50% of these are query-based data exchange, which is like FHIR, where, you know, you use APIs directly to get a data set that you're specifically querying for. And so what that means for an organization like us is that I have to have my feet in both sides of the water, right? Like, which is for 50% of, of all the all our counterparts, we have to process data as a document, unpack that document, make sure that gets normalized, and then figure out how to exchange, integrate that into our infrastructure. For the other half, there's a more direct pathway to integrate that data set directly into our infrastructure to measure quality, right? In that in, in that in that example. And so that creates that adds additional cost burden. It creates a divergence for us. And so if Tefka ends up endorsing that divergence, then I think it cre- it is also you know endorsing it also creates a situation where that organizations are kind of have to resign themselves to leave with the admin live with the ad- additional administrative cost. I'm sorry. So 
I would say that we'd like to see Tefka continue. Uh, we are excited to, to see Tefka align uh, with the direction of Tefka, align with where the industry wants to go in terms of adoption of, of, of standards and query-based data exchange and, and APIs. We'd like to continue, we'd like to strongly encourage uh, the growth in a direction that maintains the principle of consistency where we are able to exchange data with all our counterparts. It really comes down to that. I mean, we don't want a situation where we have forced to, we're forced to exchange data five different ways with, with all our counterparts. Yeah. Calling on all stakeholders to engage and participate in any future feedback sought by, by ONC and uh, the Sequoia Project. All right. So I'm curious uh, about how you guys see the role of policy in attaining consistent use of common solutions, implementation models, for example, fast uh, doing work on a national directory implementation guide uh, approach. Recently, there was a request for information on building a national directory from the government. With the fire accelerators being primarily voluntary, uh, what role do you see in standards development and policy together? Deepak? Yeah, I think there is a um, close synergy um, in, in, in from an intent standpoint, right? Like there were... I think there is a the standards development folks, the folks that are engaged in standards development and those who are actually framing policy really want the same thing. And I think that's that's an encouraging point to start. I think the 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 where I think the divergence really happens is how that change actually happens out in the industry, right? And I think there is a path that needs to balance pragmatism in terms of what's possible in the short term versus where we want to be. And that pragmatism path can sometimes lead to trade-offs that may lead us to a pathway where, you know, change may be harder to make down the road than imagine. And, you know, I, I think I used words that are a lot more abstract than I usually do. And so what I would say, I take it, taking it back down to that example that I've been talking about is that, you know, our policy in, the, in that, that the impact of any policy and any work that our standards bodies do need to make it easier for a system like ours in that situation where we're connecting to those, you know, 45 different affiliates to be able to say that we're, what we do with affiliate A is going to be identical to do what we do with affiliate B. And we ought to be able to say patient John Smith can be identified as having data in affiliate A and B without having to query affiliate A and B separately and do that 45 times with like 45 different affiliates and us collating the data ourselves. And if policy leads us in a direction where we there's there's tolerance for continuing that type of divergence, then I think that 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 is a direction that needs to be addressed in the industry. But but if policy is leading us, even if it is a little slower than expected, towards a direction of consistency, I feel that path ought to be encouraged. Yeah, Jocelyn here at Point of Care Partners, we're of course heavily involved with uh, understanding policy and its effects. How do you see that playing out uh, with uh, Da Vinci? I think I, I want to pull on um, actually Deepak and Duncan's last comments about what's happening with Tefka in the QNs. I like Deepak, I like to be really pragmatic here, right? Um, and we think about sort of where we are in reality. I, I think we're at a sea change in the industry uh, where really our, the folks that are regulating us are looking to see where industry is headed. And we've seen that over the last six to 10 years in the fire community, um, whether it be, you know, ONC following the lead of implementing fire to free patient data right out of the EHRs to now the multiple NPRMs that we're all rolling around and having fun with today and over the last year, you know, from everything from prior authorization to patient data exchange, you know, and, and seeing signals that it's going to expand beyond that. And, and that is really, I think that the, the folks that are colleagues, right, that are trying to figure out how to align the industry are looking at the thought leaders out in the market, like Duncan's organization and Deepak's organization and the accelerators to create the pattern. Um, and so if we think about sort of that convergence and the challenge around convergence with Tefka and the fire community, you know, I think it, the onus is on us to come up with the first few examples. I, Ken and I had the opportunity to go to the Care Quality Sequoia and eHealth Exchange meetings in December. And it was really encouraging to hear folks that, you know, are pretty unknown to me stand on stage and reference the FAST guides and reference the Da Vinci IGs as the way they're going to leverage fire. Now, there's a lot that needs to be unpacked there. Um, and I know that we, we're not going to be able to have time to uncover that today. But 
But I think that we need to figure out who's going to go first, who's going to create that paradigm. I think to unpack those layers of what does it really mean for us to move from this world today, which, you know, Tefka is going to primarily, you know, promote the use of document-based exchange because, because pragmatically that's what's flowing between providers today to get to that promised land that Deepak is talking about, which is I only want to exchange the data I need and fire being a really good vehicle to do that and how those partnerships work. And so I think it's going to be work in the trenches um, with, you know, the people that want to go first. Uh, and I'm encouraged coming out of those conversations that there are, you know, cute, you know, folks that are, lined up, Ken's going to correct me if I say it wrong, to be, for the people that are able to submit to be a QHIN and to, to work towards becoming a QHIN, for them to understand that supporting these implementation guides and this fair fire paradigm is going to be incredibly important to them from a market penetration and, and success perspective. Yeah, so much to talk about here, but we do have to start closing out. So we always like to ask our guests if they have any final message or calls to action to the industry. Uh, Duncan? I firmly believe that we're in the process of transformation, like I said earlier, from a pre-internet to a post-internet model in healthcare. I think there's an opportunity for every organization to evaluate what they've seen in the past for other industries when they did this transition to determine what they could be doing themselves in preparation for the future. I don't believe it's a matter of if we're going to get there, just a matter of when. And I think the benefit to the community that adopts it is going to be so much larger than those who delay that really it's important for all of us to start evaluating that now. The challenge we've had in the past for exchanging information is constrained by the siloization of data, the, as we point out throughout the structure, the engagement model. There's a whole bunch of problems we have in the community right now for exchanging information. Healthcare is an information industry. Characteristics of the population, your, your, your personal attributes is information. The mechanism by which we evaluate what diseases you have is driven by information. The mechanism by which we pay for the evaluation of what's wrong with you is an information category. The mechanism by which we improve our systems and we determine our effectiveness is information. We are an information business. Banking recognized they were an information business as far back as the 80s. Healthcare is still stuck trying to figure out whether we're a bricks and mortar industry or an information industry. I think it's very, very clear what we are. And I think the adoption of a standard like FHIR, which allows us to be able to share information directly, point to point in a consistent fashion. I think the adoption of implementation guides, which tell us how to use the FHIR standard to solve these critical problems as understood by the experts who develop them. And I think lastly, the broad adoption of a standard that is adoptable between the various participating industries, payers, providers, patients, government, researchers, and all of the others is critical to the success. So I would exhort everybody to evaluate their role in the community evaluate their use of information and figure out how they can become part of this transformational solution so that patients like you and I get the best care we can have at the most affordable rate. Oh, that was powerful. <laughs> Deepak, how could you end to that? Well, it's going to be hard to beat that, but I'd say that I've been in, in the interoperability space for over 20 years now, and I'll say that just reflecting on where we are right now is the most exciting thing is that I've seen the, I'm seeing the whole industry more activated and engaged in this space and interested in this space than they've ever been over these over these last couple of decades. It's it's from a small group of people talking HIE 24 hours. It's gone to an entire industry and adjacent industries taking an interest on uh, liberating data from electronic health records and, uh, you know, like really figuring out how to make uh, democratize the use of healthcare data to drive better care and outcomes for the populations we serve. And that is incredibly exciting to see. And I think we sometimes do get caught up in the short term about, you know, like what should TEFCA cover and what should not TEFCA not cover. And I think we will resolve that. I love the healthy debate, that uh, good fashion, good old fashioned American debate, as as we would say, that we are having in the industry about this. But, but I also think that it's the right debate to have at the right time. And I'm definitely uh, confident that will end up in a spot that leads to better outcomes for the patients we serve. Thanks. Jocelyn, final thoughts? I just think that the work that we get to do on a day-to-day -day basis out here in the industry is remarkable. The people that are involved are really some of the brightest people I've gotten to work with in my career. To Deepak's point and to Duncan's point, you know, um, we're, we are at an inflection point 
and the the momentum aspect of what is happening is palpable. Uh, and so I would just do a shout out to say, you know, if you're not paying attention, if you haven't figured out how to carve out the time or the, the resources to pick up these implementation guides and get involved and come and join the conversation, you know, we have a really robust stakeholder group um, around the fire community at large. They're sort of a home for everybody and what business problem you're trying to solve um, and what data you're trying to free to, you know, impact um, that patient experience. So figure out how to get involved. The shift from sort of building and imagining into testing and implementation and production go lives in 2023 uh, is amazing and super excited. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing, you know, how we close out the year compared to how we're starting it. Thanks. So impressive how uh, fast uh, is looking to move our industry into the future uh, with such a practical approach. Uh, all right. So in closing, I'd like to thank my POCP co-host and interop expert, Jocelyn Keegan, and to thank our passionate guests, Fast Co-Chairs Deepak Setagopin, Chief Operating Officer of Population Health with Providence, and Duncan Weatherston, CEO of Smile Digital Health. A friendly reminder... Uh, to new listeners, you can find us on Apple Podcast, on Spotify, or whatever platform you use to pick up your podcasts, including Healthcare Now Radio and the podcast channel. We also post videos of our podcast episodes, sometimes longer versions, on the POCP YouTube channel. And finally, don't forget, Health IT is a dish best served hot. Is it a challenge to stay on top of interoperability regulations and the flurry of activity with fire accelerators? Email us at interopoutlook at pocp.com to learn more about our new interoperability outlook subscription monitoring service. 